Well, would you turn with me to your Bibles to Matthew 27? It's Matthew 27, the end of Matthew 27. in the beginning of Matthew 28. And of course, this morning, on a Resurrection Sunday, we're going to be looking at a resurrection text from one of the Gospels, the Gospel according to Matthew, in verses 62 from chapter 27 through verses 10 of chapter 28. And I've titled the sermon this morning, straight from the text, The empty tomb. He is not here, for he is risen. So follow along with me as I read from chapter 27, beginning at verse 62 through 28, verse 10. The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, We remember how that imposter said while he was still alive, after three days I will rise. Therefore order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people. He has risen from the dead, and the last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard of soldiers, go, make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. On Friday, we celebrated the darkest and most evil day in human history. And it was the darkest, most evil day in human history because humanity committed the greatest act of evil by putting to death Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, God in human flesh. They mocked him. They spit on him. They beat him. They flogged him. And then they crucified him. In fact, if you've seen that movie, The Passion of the Christ by Mel Gibson, it well depicts just how graphic and gruesome his injuries were and and his physical suffering that he endured. They flogged him so mercilessly, drained all the physical strength from him, and yet they still forced him to carry his own cross down what we came to know now as the Via Dolorosa, the Way of Sorrows, 656 yards to the top of the hill in Golgotha. 
He, he was so weak, half dead already, he couldn't even do it. So they grab a random Simon of Cyrene by the wayside to help him carry his cross. And when they get there, they lay him on the cross and drive five-inch spikes through his hands and a seven-inch spike through his feet and nail him to that cross. He hung there in agony for six hours until he finally yielded his spirit to the Father. And so it, it's funny that even though it was the greatest act of evil mankind has ever committed, there's a great paradox of the cross. And that even though it is the greatest act of evil that mankind ever concocted and committed, it is simultaneously the greatest act and expression of divine love from God. That's why we Christians call it Good Friday, don't we? Because we know that even though this vile, despicable, horrible act was committed by the hands of men, it was committed according to the predetermined plan of God. It was God who determined to send his son to die in the place of sinners as a substitute, a substitutionary death for sin that sinners could never die, and in so doing, procuring for them redemption, forgiveness of sin, reconciliation, peace with God, salvation. It was all part of God's plan all along. He just used evil men to do it. And we rejoice at that. We know we could have never paid the penalty on our own. We're incapable of it. It required a perfect sacrifice. Only God in human flesh could have paid that. Only his blood could have covered it, the blood of the new covenant. He purchased forgiveness for us. But can I submit something to you this morning? That Jesus' atoning death on the cross was not enough? On its own. Jesus' atoning death on the cross, on its own, was not enough. Just think about that for a second. It was not enough because he had to have been raised from the dead in order for God to confirm that he accepted his sacrifice in our place. You see, it was the resurrection through which God vindicated Jesus' claims to be God, the Son of God, Lord, and confirmed that he accepted his death in the place of sinners as a once-for-all sacrifice for whoever would believe. You see, the resurrection is everything. Without the resurrection, the atonement is meaningless. But we have the resurrection. Jesus was raised from the dead on the third day. That's what the entire New Testament teaches, doesn't it? That's why Jesus himself repeatedly taught the disciples that he must go and he would be killed and handed over, but on the third day he would rise from the grave. They didn't get it. The apostles and their companions, the whole New Testament witness is replete with this. 
The apostolic teaching from the very outset of the church, if you follow the explosion of the church in the book of Acts, starting with Peter in Acts 2, in the very first sermon that we have recorded on the pages of Scripture, he focuses on Jesus' resurrection. And you follow his preaching through the book of Acts, and it's the same thing until the book of Acts switches, and now it moves from Peter and his ministry to the Jews to Paul and his ministry to the Gentiles. And again, it's the resurrection that takes central focus because they knew the resurrection is everything. That's why Paul says to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, if Christ wasn't raised from the dead, then our faith is in vain. We've wasted our time. We have no hope. We're the most to be pitied. It's all been in vain. You might as well just eat, drink, and be merry because it's over. But then he continues to say in that exact same chapter, but Christ was raised from the dead. And because Christ was raised from the dead, our hope is not in vain. Our faith is not in vain. Because he was raised from the dead, he secured also our future bodily resurrection from the dead that will be equipped and fit and ready, made to live with him in his heavenly presence, in his kingdom forever. That's the hope the resurrection brings. And so I want to look at that this morning from the perspective of the religious leaders, the chief priests, the scribes, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, and from the perspective of a few women, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and a few other women. And so follow along with me. as we pick it up in verses 62 and 63. The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that imposter said, while he was still alive, after three days I will, I will rise. Okay, so it's the day of preparation. Sorry, the day after preparation, it says which would make it Saturday. Saturday was the Sabbath. Therefore, Friday to them was the day of preparation for the Sabbath, and particularly all the feasts that were associated with a Sabbath celebration now, this time of the year during Passover. And it also happens to coincide this particular day of preparation, at least after, with Jesus' crucifixion, which, of course, we as Christians now know today as Good Friday. And after Jesus died on the cross and breathed his last, we see Matthew tell us in the verses preceding, in verses 57 to 61, that Joseph of Arimathea came to Pilate and he requested Jesus' body so he could prepare him and anoint him and give him a proper traditional Jewish burial. And Pilate agrees so he takes his body down, perhaps with Mary Magdalene and, and Mary, the mother of James, and a few of these other women who were there, prepared Jesus' body, anointed him for burial, placed him in the grave, closed it with that massive rock to seal it shut. And Jesus has been in the grave since Friday, since Friday evening. And Matthew tells us now it's the next day. So it's the Sabbath. It's the Sabbath, and the chief priests come to see Pilate. They come to see Pilate, but for sure, not in his house, not in the praetorium. They're probably speaking to him in the courtyard. It's the Sabbath. They would never want to defile themselves with his Gentile filth. Just like in John 18, when they first brought Jesus before him, they spoke to him from the courtyard because they didn't want to defile themselves. So they're speaking to him. They have another problem now, another issue. And what's their problem? Sir, we remember before this imposter, this deceiver, 
this false king of Nazareth of the Jews, Jesus, before he died, he said that he would be raised on the third day, after the third day. So, so could you please give us some guards so that they can go and seal the, the tomb, the entrance to the tomb with a Roman wax seal and they can guard the tomb? Lest his disciples come and take his body Order the tomb, made secure until the third day, so that they don't do that. Because if they do that, this last fraud of them claiming he was raised from the dead when all they did was actually steal his body, will be worse than the first when he claimed while he was still alive that he'd be raised for the dead. Plus, don't forget, Pilate, you're already on thin ice with the emperor, Tiberius. All the social and civil unrest in Judea, you can't afford any more of that. And I can promise you one thing, if they steal Jesus' body, that's exactly what's going to happen. It'll be greater tumult and social unrest and revolting than when he was alive. So why don't you just give us some men to do that? And it's incredible irony here. You can't really see it in the English, in the original. But they address him as sir. And it's the exact same word that Matthew translates every single time, without exception, other than a few of the parables, which are stories, that he reserves exclusively for Jesus. It's the word which is translated Lord, kurios. Kind of like in John 19, 15, uh, at the trial, in his account, where they say, what do you want me to do with this king of the Jews? He said, he's not our king. We don't have a king. We have no king but Caesar. Now the Romans are their lord? The Romans are their kurios? Not the rightful, one, true kurios, Jesus? And it's also incredible to think about that it's the religious leaders that remember that Jesus on several occasions taught that he would die and rise from the dead on the third day. It's his enemies who remember it. Not the disciples. That doesn't make any sense. And even more ironic is that the chief priest and the Pharisees, they want guards at the tomb to prevent the disciples from stealing the body. When stealing the body would be the furthest thing on the disciples' minds at this point. They're gone. Yet they're scared that these guys are going to steal Jesus' body. They didn't even remember that he said he was going to rise on the third day, or let alone understand what he meant by that. Please, Pilate, it's in your best interest. What are these chief priests and, and these Pharisees so worried about? I mean, they're worried that the disciples are actually going to steal Jesus' body. These disciples, who when they came to arrest Jesus in the garden, ran fleeing like a bunch of cowards. You're worried that these guys would be brave enough, courageous enough to go to his tomb and steal his body? That doesn't make any sense to me. You say, well, well maybe they were afraid that they would, and if they stole the body, uh, the, the uproar and the uprising that that would cause, and the power and influence over the people that they would lose if they were to purport this, this lie about Jesus being raised from the dead, they were worried about losing that. They were scared of losing that. Maybe. That might be true. But I think there's something else here. I think there's something more that they were afraid of. 
I don't think they were scared of the disciples. The disciples ran away scared after the garden. And none of them came back to Jerusalem except for Peter and John. And if they were really that scared of them, they could have just arrested them in the garden anyways when they arrested Jesus. They could have chased them down, traced them, tracked them, and threw them in prison. No, I don't think they were afraid of the disciples. I think that they were afraid that Jesus' resurrection power might actually show up. I think they were afraid that Jesus might actually come back from the dead. I mean, these guys were no dummies. All right, let's be honest. As hypocritical, as falsely religious as they were, they were not dummies. They may not have understood Jesus' person, but they knew his power. They had seen him in action for the better part of three years. They knew exactly what Jesus was capable of. They'd seen him give sight to the blind. They'd seen him give hearing to the deaf. They'd seen him give speech to the mute. They'd seen him make the lame walk. They'd seen him heal all sorts of diseases and leprosy. In fact, just a few days before this, they'd even seen him raise Lazarus from the dead. They weren't there, but it says a bunch of witnesses, the Jews, immediately ran to them and reported to them what they saw, and they didn't deny the report. They conceded it. They simply said, we got to do something about this. We can't let him go on like this. If he does, we're going to lose our power. We're going to lose our influence. We got to do something about it. And they continued their plotting to kill him. So they knew. They never denied Jesus' power to do miracles. It couldn't. It was undeniable to anyone who had eyeballs. They simply attributed it to Satan. Remember? Remember? He's casting out Satan by Satan, the power of Beelzebul. I think they were afraid that he might actually come back from the grave. And look at verses 65 to 66. How does Pilate respond to their request for soldiers and a seal? Pilate said to them, you have a guard of soldiers. Go, make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by, by sealing the stone and setting a guard. Here, be my guest. Take a few of my soldiers, and they'll seal it with a Roman wax seal to secure the tomb and to deter any prospect of grave robbers from coming to rob it, including Jesus' disciples. Go ahead. Do whatever you got to do. He's kind of dismissive about him, almost sarcastic. He's had enough of them. They've created so many problems for him already. Take your soldiers and get out of here. Do as best as you can, type of a thing. And grave robbers was a, a common problem in that ancient Near Eastern society. It happened a lot. So a couple, two, three, four, five Roman soldiers stationed outside would have been a massive deterrent. And even if they weren't there, that official Roman seal around the door, that would have been a huge deterrent for prospective grave robbers. Because that would mean anyone who's breaking and entering and taking from the Romans their Roman property was liable to imprisonment, maybe even death. So the chief priests think they have this all figured out. They're doing whatever they can, humanly speaking, to prevent Jesus actually coming back from the dead with his own, in their minds, satanic power, or maybe even the disciples somehow getting access to the tomb and taking his body. And then chapter 20, verse 1. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, 
Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. So it's the day after the Sabbath, which was Saturday. That's the Sabbath. This is Sunday morning now. It's at dawn or just before dawn, and Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, are on the way to see the tomb. They're on the way to see the tomb. Mark adds that there's a woman named Salome who's there with them, and Luke adds a woman named Joanna, and he also says, and some other women. So this is a group of women, maybe five, six, or more women who are on their way to see the tomb. And you notice Matthew's language, he's been saying this a lot, like see, look, behold, and his whole gospel is kind of written that way because it's meant to be an expansive, extensive witness, citing and fulfilling even Old Testament scriptures and eyewitness accounts of those who've seen Jesus's ministry, heard Jesus's teaching, seen his miraculous works, seen his death on the cross, and are about to see what else he's going to do. In verse 2. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. So suddenly, an angel of the Lord comes down from heaven and his coming down produces seismic waves that reverberate throughout the earth and the ground underneath the tomb. The door, the massive door, rolls away And he's sitting on the tomb door. Verse 3. His appearance was like lightning. And his clothing white as snow. Kind of like the apocalyptic descriptions that Daniel uses, right? In, in Daniel 7, 9, and then in 10, 6, to describe the ancient of days. But I think even more than that, it brings to mind what Matthew just described a few chapters earlier at, at the transfiguration on the mount in Matthew 17 of Jesus when he says, his face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as light. And this angel comes down from heaven in such glory and in such power that he produces an earthquake. That's the idea. And the earthquake itself is what shatters the door and the seal in the door and the tomb is wide open. And look at his appearance. How are these guards going to respond? How are these mighty, revered, powerful, brave, bloodthirsty, fearsome, loathsome Roman soldier is going to respond to just seeing this supernatural experience, this supernatural being coming down from heaven with that awesome power. Look at verse 4. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. They were literally scared to death. And the colloquial translation would be, they fainted in terror. They fell into a dead faint. They became white as ghosts. And I would venture to guess, the whiteness of their complexion was probably close to the whiteness of the angel at that point. That's how terrified of a sight this is. For a human natural being. And there's amazing wordplay here that you can't quite see in the English, depending on what translation you have. But it's on the word quake. Same word for quake and tremble. It says, The angel came down in such power and majesty and glory that the earth quaked. And the Roman soldiers saw the angel, and now they're quaking. They're quaking in their boots so much so that they faint. And, and there's another irony here. The ones who were assigned to guard the dead, now 
themselves appear to be dead. And the one who was dead may no longer be. Hmm. Verses 5 to 7. The Roman guards are terrified. They fall into a dead faint. And this all happens seemingly as the women arrive. The way Matthew describes his account, it seems like they're there. They've seen this. And knowing they're terrified at what they've just seen, they've seen him come down. They saw the earthquake. The stone moved away. The guards shaking in their boots, quaking, falling, fainting over. And what does the angel of the Lord move to do? He moves to alleviate their fears. Verse 5, he says, But the angel said to the woman, to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. I know you've come seeking Jesus of Nazareth, the one who was crucified, your master, your teacher. But he's not here. Well, where is he? What do you mean he's not here? What have you done with him? Where have you taken him? Show me where he is so I can go to him. He said, do you remember what he told you while he was yet with you? Hmm? That on the third day he will rise? What day is it today? It's the third day. And now he's done exactly as he said he would. He is risen. Go see for yourself. And after you've had a few moments to gather your thoughts and all the emotions and feelings that you're experiencing now, the fear, the joy, the anxiety, the peace, you need to go to tell his disciples too. Because this is good news of great joy. And it's not meant for you to keep this to yourself. Everyone needs to know this. And especially his disciples need to know this. Because right now they still think he's dead. They think he's in the grave. They're scared. They're mourning him. They don't know what to do. They don't understand what happened. They're ashamed of abandoning him. They need to know that their master and their Messiah lives. So go tell them. And I want you to think about this for a second. If you put yourself in the position of these women, okay, they love Jesus. They followed him everywhere. They were there when he was flogged mercilessly half to death. They were there as he carried that heavy cross on the Via Dolorosa all the way to Golgotha. They were there as the soldiers nailed his hands and his feet to that wooden cross. They were there as he hung there in agony for six painful hours. They were so close, they were there that maybe even when the soldier thrust and pierced his his side with the spear, all the blood and water that, that came out maybe even got on them. And they were there when he breathed his last. They were there when Joseph asked to take him down from the cross. They were there at his burial. They buried him. 
and they thought he was dead. They thought he was gone forever. And their hearts were broken because of it. And now their hearts are full again. They were full of pain, and now they're full of joy because their Savior lives. They should have known that he would come back from the dead, just like the disciples should have known. Jesus said so himself repeatedly, repeatedly. Even the religious leaders knew. And yet they have a, a fickle faith at best, an insufficient faith, doubt. They didn't understand all the teaching, all the kingdom parables that they had personally explained to them over and over and over again. And how does Jesus respond to these women and their faith? their supposed lack of faith. Is he angry at them? Does he blast them once again for being dull, hard of heart, you of little faith and little understanding? Look at verse 8. So he departed quickly from the tomb with fear and, and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Now, you can imagine the range of emotions that these women are experiencing after this encounter with the angel, seeing the empty tomb. Fear turns to joy or mixed with joy. Anxiety turns to peace or mixed with peace. They go, they're running all the way back to, to find Peter and John and tell the rest of the disciples, scurrying along. And then suddenly, Jesus appears. And he says, greetings, which could actually be translated, be, rejoice, be glad, have joy. And do not be afraid. Because I'm here. I've arisen. And I'm Lord. And because I have, you too have the hope of resurrection glory. So rejoice. Don't be scared. And now go and tell the rest of the disciples. Go and tell them that I'm going to go on ahead and I'm going to meet them in Galilee. Go and tell my brothers. Actually, he says, did you notice? He calls them my brothers. And so here you see Jesus' response to these women of little faith, of little understanding, and his disciples who abandoned him in his greatest moment of need. And now after the cross and after the resurrection, they're his brothers. And by extension, these women, his sisters. And, and Jesus' response here to his disciples in embracing them as his brothers, it should encourage you and I who believe today, shouldn't it? How many times has your faith failed? How many times have you cowered away from Jesus? Like the disciples. How many times have you chosen not to stand with Jesus and to proclaim Jesus and to share Jesus with someone because you were afraid or embarrassed of the consequences socially. I 
And yet Jesus says to you, greetings. Rejoice and be at peace. You are my brother. You are my sister for whom I died, whose salvation and redemption I purchased, and I came back from the grave, which means I'm exactly who I said I was. And you are mine, and I am yours. And that's how he responds to our lack and our lowly and our little faith. But only for those who believe, right? We know that only those who, who believe can say that, can be encouraged by that. As small and as little as our belief and our faith is, it's because we believe and have faith. It's only those who confess Jesus as Lord and follow him have his victory over the grave and over sin and death and the hope of a future glorified resurrection body meant to live with him in his presence, in his kingdom, in heaven forever. But those who believe don't. Sorry, those who don't believe don't. Not everyone responds with belief and with faith to this resurrection power of Jesus. Look at the guards and how fickle they were. And the chief priests in the Sanhedrin. What happens in verses 11 to 15? Matthew says, they run away scared and they report back to the chief priests what they saw. Everything they saw. The angel, the earthquake, the tomb, wide open, Jesus' body gone. And what do the chief priests do? Matthew says they take counsel. They conspire with the Sanhedrin again. The same people, the, the ruling body and council politically of, of Israel, of the Jews, who they conspired with to murder Jesus, and now they conspire again. What are we going to do here? Hmm. I know. Here, take this money. So they conspire to bribe the guards and pay them a substantial amount of money to keep their mouths shut. Actually, not to keep their mouths shut, to tell a lie about what they saw and what they happened. What happened? You take this money, and if anyone asks you, you tell them that you were there guarding the tomb, you fell asleep at night, and the disciples came away and stole the body. And don't worry about Pilate, the governor. Don't worry if he hears that you failed your military duty and fell asleep as a Roman soldier. We'll take care of him. We have a lot of money. We can pay him too if that will appease him. And then Matthew says, and this lie, this story of the disciples stealing Jesus' body was told even up to his day, the day that he was writing his gospel in the early to mid-50s. Twenty years later after this happened. And actually this story is still told today by some, by those who are looking for Every possible reason to deny the resurrection and the deity and the divinity and the lordship of Jesus as God. Along with a handful of other ridiculous theories about the resurrection and what happened to Jesus' body. Because that's what unbelievers do. That's what a hard heart does. It looks for every possible reason to not believe. Just like them. And so that brings me to my next question. To those of you who maybe by chance are tuning in today online, especially now that you've been confronted with the resurrection power of Jesus this morning, like the religious leaders, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Are you going to keep trying to secure yourself away from Jesus and any possible contemplation and thoughts about Jesus? 
What are you going to do? You're going to keep turning to activity, to stuff, to distractions, to the things of this world, occupying your mind and your time with entertainment, I don't know, social media, internet, movies, film, everything and anything but Jesus, so that you ignore your friends who, who invite you to go to church and hear a sermon about Jesus, or invite you to go to a Bible study, or so you have no time to even open the Bible yourself to even consider this Jesus. Or, or I know you, you're going to turn to sin. You're just going to keep on sinning and plunge yourself into the deepest and the darkest and the ugliest sin imaginable, whatever that looks like in your life, whatever satisfies you, whatever gratifies you, go deeper and deeper and darker on that path because you know Jesus ain't there. Because Jesus is the sinless, blameless Son of God, and he's far removed from sin. And he won't find you there. Oh, I know. Why don't you turn to religion? Turn to religiosity for the sake of religiosity. Turn to ceremonies and rituals. Don't question why or when or how you're doing what you're doing. or You're just doing it because you were told to do it. Or that's how everyone's always done it. Don't contemplate biblical Christianity for a second. Just keep going through the motions outwardly for the sake of appearances so that everyone around you can see how how good and how holy and how righteous you are. And you know what? In all of these things, or whatever you end up doing to secure yourself from Jesus' resurrection power, the only thing you're doing is digging your own grave. You're entombing yourself. You're rolling that tomb door shut, and you're sealing it with a Roman seal, and you're posting your guards on the outside to keep you as far and as hidden from Jesus and him finding you is possible. But you know what? Jesus has broken his tomb seal and his tomb door. Jesus has caused Roman guards to flee in terror. He scattered them. Jesus has conquered sin and death. He broke the tomb. And he can break your tomb too. No matter how well you fortify yourself in it. So what are you going to do when he comes bursting forth in glorious majesty and light and power? I'll tell you what I would do. I would let go of my sin. I would let go of everything and anything I'm turning to just to turn away from him and avoid him at all costs. I'd turn away from everything that I thought I was finding and chasing satisfaction and fulfillment in that was not satisfying or not fulfilling me. And I would drop to my knees in prayer and cry out like Thomas to Jesus and say, my Lord and my God. I would let go of my seals. I would let go of my doors. I would let go of all my guarding activity. And I would surrender myself completely to Jesus as my Lord and as my Savior. 
and watch what he'll do with you and watch what he'll do for you. Resurrection. Glory. Peace. Hope. Forgiveness. That no one could ever take away from you. And what about us Christians? Uh, how should we respond to, to this greatest, most hope producing event in redemptive history? Jesus' resurrection. How should we respond to this? Well, Matthew gives us a hint, and he actually ends his gospel this way in verses 16 to 20, and particularly 18 to 20. It's the Great Commission. It's the Great Commission. Friends, we have resurrection hope and power living inside of us. This is not a message that we've been commissioned to keep for ourselves. This is not a lamp that you hide under a rock. It's a lamp that you put on a table on top of a hill to shine forth. The whole world needs to know about this hope that we have in Jesus who conquered sin and death, who was raised from the grave by the power of God and who is now sitting at the right hand of God in all majesty and all power and all authority under heaven and on earth has been given to him. We're to preach the gospel to every creature. Everyone needs to know this. Because it's the only hope they have. And those that do respond, those that do believe, you baptize them and you keep teaching them how to be disciples, how to be followers of Christ, what a follower of Christ looks like. Look, I don't know if there's a better time. I don't know if there's been a better time in your life or mine to preach the gospel and Jesus' resurrection power than now. I don't think there's been a better time at least in the last 20 years. When the world as we know it is seemingly falling apart at the seams. People are dying. People are scared of dying. People are, are scared of losing their loved ones to this virus. They're losing their wealth, their money, everything they've worked so hard for their entire lives, their jobs. They're in sheer and utter panic and terror. Everywhere you look, you can't turn on the TV or scroll on your phone or on your laptop without seeing this. They desperately need to hear the hope of the gospel, the resurrection hope of Jesus. Even if they themselves don't know that this is the only hope they have in a fallen and falling world. You know that. And I know that. Especially in a time such as this. Do you think it's coincidence that this week leading up to Easter Sunday, today, Resurrection Sunday, the Holy Week, the Passion Week, and the next week to follow, that these two weeks have been predicted by researchers and scientists of epidemiology and pandemic modeling to be the most deadly two weeks in this country? Do you think that's a coincidence? Do you think it's a coincidence that today, Resurrection Sunday, April the 12th, was predicted by these same researchers and scientists to be the single most deadly day in all this pandemic in America? Do you think it's coincidence that that's today? Resurrection Sunday? I don't. It's not coincidence. It's providence. 
Because God knew that now, today, more than ever, the lost and dying and panicked and terrorized people of this country need to hear, need to know, and need to experience the resurrection power and peace of Jesus. Look, our churches may be empty, but so is the tomb. And we need to take this hope and this joy and this peace to everyone around us. Bow with me in a word of prayer.